The Greek philosopher Aristotle once said, give me a child until he is seven and I will show you the man. Now we have a better understanding that this is because the first seven years are when our minds are in a more malleable state. So everything we see and experience in that time heavily influences the kind of person we grow up to be. Unfortunately, this means it is a period when a great trauma can severely impact our lives for decades to come, or even till we die if we do not consciously do something to overcome the experience. One who understands this better than most is a young woman named Paula. As a young girl of four years old, she witnessed a massive tree falling in her yard and killing her father, a branch having plunged right through his chest. The image haunted her so severely that she grew horrified to tread even remotely close to any tree larger than a few feet. Eventually, she became so frightened of trees that she began seeking jobs that would allow her to live in a place free of them altogether. She'd claim becoming a glaciologist was simply a genuine desire of hers, and, well, partially true, her yearning to live in Antarctica studying glacial movements was inspired by her fear. But even fleeing to Antarctica after her final year of university did not put her far enough away from the hunt of the demon, Dendravour. After having been stationed in Antarctica for a few months, there came a day that started like any other, during which Paula had set off on her own to gather ice core samples, layers of built-up compressed snow that composed glaciers. She was never meant to do these tasks alone, but often did so as she enjoyed the solitude. She gathered two cores from different locations, listened to the calm, whispering wind, and was at least fairly at ease. But as she began her trek back to base, she was faced with an unexpected and horrific sight. Standing in the middle of the open, icy field was a tree. It had black bark and stretched out with jagged branches to a height of over 20 feet tall. There was no logical way the thing could be growing out here, and beyond that, it certainly hadn't been there when she'd arrived. She thought at first she must be imagining things, or even considered that she may be dreaming, but she quickly ruled out those options. She tried to simply walk far around the thing, but as she started to move, she heard cracking under the ice and snow. Suddenly, shooting up from the ice beneath, blocking her path, was a black branch with a massive hand at its end, reaching far above her head. She dropped the ice cores and ran in the opposite direction, only to have another tendril spring up before her. She turned back to the tree and now saw it had sprouted a face. It had needle teeth and eyes with sticks sprouting from them. Crimson sap seeped from it as it lunged more branches up around her. Little did she know at the time, this was the demon, Dendravour, who'd hunted her for months now, as it was a demon who yearned for those with a fear of trees, and had developed incredible tracking senses as a result of few people having such a fear. It slowly twisted its branches around her, but allowed her to escape, as it wanted her to have some sense of hope before it crushed that hope. It made her dodge around more and more vines as she sprinted as fast as she could back towards her base, screaming for help. Her cries ceased, however, as she heard calls just as desperate as her own. She reached her base and saw her co-workers were already bound in branches and held to the ground, slowly becoming more and more encased. This, however, may have been a mistake on Dendravour's part. The desire to help others can sometimes spur more courage than we'd have for protecting ourselves, and Paula instinctively ran and grabbed an axe stored outside the base. Trembling, she turned back to see Dendravour slinking along the icy ground towards her, growing taller and taller as it bared its teeth. While still unsure if she'd be brave enough to do anything with it, Paula ran right back towards the creature, swinging the axe at any branches that came into her path. She got close to the beast and raised the weapon above her head, but it was then plucked right from her grip by a branch behind her. With the beastly tree now looming over her, images flashed through her mind of it falling onto her and crushing her, branches puncturing through her body. But the now muffled cries from those she worked with seemed to spur an idea in her mind. The tree couldn't fall on her if she was on top of it. She leapt onto its base and started scrambling her way up its body. Branches lashed out at her and the demon writhed, but she held tight and kept climbing until she was right in front of its face. It thrust its jaw towards her and she nearly fell back, but snatched hold of the twigs spawning from its eyes. The demon shrieked in pain, and that sent a wave of hope through Paula. 
She suddenly yanked her arms back and tore its eyes right from the demon's head, falling and slamming back to the icy ground. Through winded breath, she choked back air, still half expecting the creature to fall on her. But it didn't. It continued to writhe and shriek and scrambled away, loosing its hold on her friends as it fled. Paula helped the others up, and they all tried to make sense of what had just occurred. They had no idea if the creature would return, but one thing Paula did know for certain was that literally coming face to face with her greatest fear and making it fear her instead had been the most exhilarating experience of her life. If it did return, they'd do what they had to to be ready, this time to kill it for good. That story turned out a little bit longer than I was expecting, but I am quite pleased with it. In fact, I, I like how the art turned out in this enough, but I think I like the story even better. I did do the art first and had the basic idea of the story as I did it, but hadn't put together the piece that it was going to take place in Antarctica, so I made the ground underneath the drawing not snow. The main inspiration for this design that I was taking was from just kind of creepy, different, real-life trees. I was looking at lots of images of trees in swamps. The face turned out looking more like Groot than I had hoped for. I actually went in specifically wanting it to not look like Groot, but it did kind of end up going that way, and I'm not really bummed by it. I think it does still look pretty cool and menacing. I'm pretty pleased with this, and I hope you all are as well, and I hope you enjoy the compilation to follow, which include my four previous Phobias as Demons episode and my Elements as Demons episode, which technically counts as a Phobias as Demons episode as well. By the way, hitting the like button does always help videos do a little bit better. No pressure to if you don't want to, but anyone who does, I very much appreciate that. Anyway, let's take a look at the finished result and enjoy the rest of the video. Given enough attention and focus, fear can flourish and infest one's mind. It can be a useful warning to alert us to danger, but when it's allowed to stew and simmer and overwhelm us frequently, that's when problems can arise. It directly calls out to the universe like a beacon for terrible things to come find us. But the worst fate of all for one who becomes overrun with fear is to draw unto themselves the attention of a demon. Anger, loathing, grief, shame, these are all emotions that can draw the beady eyes of a demon upon you, but the one they crave most of all is fear. The more it's allowed to overtake the mind of an individual on a consistent basis, the more that person is essentially marinating themselves for the monster's feast. Some demons crave a specific type of fear, and often have an appearance and abilities perfect for imbuing beings with that fear. One of these demons is Aerophantus, a monster that quite literally is a bat out of hell. It's a vicious, gangly beast with massive clawed feet and a tail that too can snatch up prey. It seeks out those with a paralyzing fear of flying, and with any of its talons it will grab them and soar into the air. It will fumble with its grip to make the person feel as though at any moment they could slip free and fall to their deaths. Little do they often know that a quick fall to the earth would be a kinder fate. This demon will keep the person airborne for days, flying up and down, dropping them then swooping in to catch them before they can strike earth. As the prey grows more nauseous and terrified and exhausted, the creature's appetite grows and grows. Once it feels that the fear has been stoked out and drawn out of the person enough, when they've essentially bathed in the horrors of their fate, it will feast. But a demon's appetite is unappeasable, and soon it will find another with the flavor of fear it seeks. Now I had a very specific idea in mind going into this for what I wanted to do with the colors of all these demons. I was going to make all of them mostly black and gray, but each having one specific pop of color. With this one, I don't really know why I went with green specifically, I was just kind of drawn to that for this one. I don't really have any connection between green and a fear of flying. But in the end, I'm really glad I went with it. I think it looks really cool. I don't know if the green really adds to it being creepier, but I think it looks really nice. I also wanted to go into all of these with a simple premise in mind, and then just flesh out that simplicity with more creepy, gross kind of textures. Kind of like what I do with the Pokemon as SCPs videos. 
I really like the art I've been doing in those. It's not super time consuming, and it always turns out really nicely, in my opinion anyway. So I tried to approach these drawings with that same kind of idea, except of course I'm designing a creature from scratch. And I think it turns out really well. I love how all the art in this episode turned out. So let's take a look at our Aerophobia Demon. Now demons are often created with a specific purpose. They are made as a means to an end for whatever Dark Master called them into being. But the ones I speak of today have been made only to feed and further promote the fear they crave. The next is the Ophidaemon, a monstrous snake as tall as a house with a lifeless gaze and vicious bite. It lurks in snake-infested mountains and valleys, often hiked by travelers, waiting for one with an intense fear of snakes to come across one in their travels. When one does, the terror that emits from them sends out a call to the Ophidaemon to come and find them. If the person is with companions who don't share their fear, it won't bother devouring them. It will often slice through them with its bladed tail, leaving only the one with the fear it thirsts for. Then, with either its fangs or any of the spikes emitting from its hide, it stabs its prey, injecting them with its venom. This venom does not kill, but does something far worse to someone who fears serpents. The person will begin to hallucinate and see snakes everywhere. It will feel as though snakes are slithering all over their skin, with of course the only real snake near them, the Ophid Daemon, constantly sliding around them, staring, basking in the horror that their prey is feeling. Some may even get a spark of bravery in a case like this, seeing that the Ophidaemon has sections of its body exposed where its scaly flesh is missing, revealing the tissue underneath, the victim may try grabbing a stick or pocket knife to stab at the exposed area. But this will only add to their horror when the demon makes no attempt to stop them. They can strike and strike all they please, but quickly they'll see that nothing they do can harm the serpent. The exposed areas are specifically meant to give them a false sense of hope at harming their foe. The fleeting hope they may have felt vanishes, and their fear remerges full force. Like with Aerophantus, this demon can allow the torment to go on for days, watching their prey grow more and more exhausted and fearful. Once it senses that the fear has reached a peak, it will swallow its prey whole, reveling in the final spurts of terror from the person as they are digested alive. Now this was the demon that I was by far most excited to design because I'm the opposite of having a fear of snakes. I love snakes. I think they're super cool and I was really excited to design another one. I mean, pr people probably got a sense that I like snakes from the fact that the main dragon I drew in the Battle for the Beast World Multiverse Tales crossover event was basically just a giant cobra. And there's definitely some similar elements of that dragon in this creature, but I tried to make it different enough and I really wanted to make this one creepier. So having the sort of exposed brain and, and body, I, I felt that just looked super cool. I really, really like how this one turned out. One of its eyes is a little bit skewed, but you know, it's a demon. It's supposed to be a little bit not symmetrical, I guess. By the way, I'm gonna play around with this lighting a little bit more. My friend Renee suggested that I get these bulbs that can change colors, that I can just switch them up on my phone, and I figured for Halloween-y sorts of episodes, putting a bit of red or orange lighting in the back could be kind of cool. But anyway, let's take a look at the finished drawing. Now something you may be asking is, what hope do I have? If I have the fear the demon seeks, what can I do to protect myself if it finds me to be worthy prey? Well that leads me to a tale I've been told by a woman who survived a demon attack. Kara Brigham suffered from an intense fear of thunder and lightning. She had it as long as she could remember, and as a young adult even moved to Nevada to avoid rainstorms as much as possible. But even then, the fear always lingered in the back of her mind, and any loud noise could trigger her to think about it. This fear eventually drew the attention of a Stromer. This is a demon of storms. Its body emits vapors to create clouds around it. It has drums spurring from its back and forehead that can emit deafening cannons of sound, and from its hands it can summon electricity to fire volts of lightning. 
Astromer found Kara, soared down to her in a vortex of wind and smog, and snatched her off the ground, flying her away to a remote location where it could enact its torture. It dropped her, then commenced to create a thick fog of cloud all around her so she could barely see a foot in front of her face. It then fired lightning and cannons of sound sporadically near her from all directions. The more she tried to flee, the more disoriented she got. Her heart pounded. She lost all focus on what was real. She breathed so rapidly she risked passing out. This went on for what she said felt like hours, before suddenly something clicked in her. You can call it the most intense exposure therapy possible, but Kara simply called it a message from God, sent into her soul to say cease your fear and you'll be safe. She forced her breathing to slow, and she stopped running. She stood firm in place as thunder exploded around her. It was the hardest thing she'd ever done to not allow the fear to continue its tirade in her mind. But she disciplined her thinking and accepted her surroundings as nothing more than a cruel show. The longer she remained calm, the more the clouds faded. Kara didn't know if the thunder was actually quieting or if she was simply used to it, but either way, it eventually ceased. The clouds vanished and the demon was gone. Of course, that wasn't the last any would see of Astromer, but in the very least, Kara was safe from its terror. A few weeks later, Kara would find herself in a regular storm, but instead of cowering from the thunder, it now simply reminded her of her own bravery. Now I know this whole episode is supposed to be focused around creepy, horrific monster kinds of things, but I felt like I needed one story in there that was a little bit more hopeful and uplifting of someone overcoming their fear. I spend a lot of my time while I'm working on stuff, listening to very hopeful, positive things, motivational speeches, audiobooks on present-mindedness, all that kind of stuff, so I was like, I gotta have one uplifting tale in here. As for the design of this one, I really like how it turned out, although I feel like for Thunder and Lightning, maybe I should have gone with something bigger and bulkier. The reason I didn't was I didn't want this to just end up being like a demon version of Thor. Although now that I think about that, I don't know why I wanted to avoid that. That actually sounds really cool. Maybe I'll do Marvel characters as demons sometime, although I guess that's probably been done by someone. But whatever, my job is not to be original, it's to make cool stuff. Anyway, let's take a look at the finished result of this one. Now some demons have a harder time finding suitable prey than others, but one stands out above all as having the most selection when it comes to its next meal. This is Arachnibus. It feeds on those with immense fear of spiders, and it rarely has to search long to find someone. Interestingly, it tends to lurk in places with very few spiders, and especially few large ones, as people who have spent their lives around large spiders tend to be less fearful of them. The more unknown something is to you, the more likely you are to fear it. When it finds a suitable prey, it will lash up a series of webs connected to trees or rocks or whatever is nearby, then slowly creep towards the person, revealing itself in full. The person will often run, as to be expected, and the demon will do all it can to direct the person right into one of its many traps. Once the person is held in place, Arachnibus will allow them to thrash and writhe, trying to escape while it lurks nearby, staring at them and watching them, with venom dripping from its mandibles as though it were salivating at the thought of its meal. In the rare case where the prey is able to free themselves, it will often bite the person, paralyzing them, but leaving them completely awake. It will then slowly wrap them up in webs, starting from their feet up so they can watch as the creature approaches their head. But then it will stop, ensuring that they are still fully able to stare at the creature that now stands directly over them, dripping venom onto their bound body. It will then leave and return multiple times, moving very slowly, every time causing more and more fear that this may be the moment when the creature finally feasts. When it is finally ready to devour its terrified prey, it will string them up by their feet, let them take one last horrific up-close look before it takes its first bite into their head. Now I'm not gonna lie, I think this one turned out kinda cute. That definitely wasn't my intention, I was trying to make it creepy as well, but the, the sort of demon grin that I put textured on its mandibles paired with its big round eyes, 
and the fact that it's the, probably the most colorful of all the ones I did today. I don't know, I, I think it kind of looks like a sort of adorable, friendly Halloween spider monster thing. I don't know if that really makes sense, but I don't know. I don't really think this one turned out as creepy looking as some of the other ones. But then again, I don't really have a specific fear of spiders. Like, I'd rather not have them crawling around on me or something, but if I see one, I tend to not be freaked out by it. So maybe if you have arachnophobia, first of all, I would be surprised if you actually ended up watching this. Good on you for being brave. But yeah, maybe if you do have a fear of spiders, this thing really creeps you out, but I don't know, I think it turned out pretty cute. But you can judge for yourselves, let's take a look at the finished result. At any moment, a demon could choose to seek out and torment anyone they so desire. But in many cases, they'll only hunt down prey that holds within their mind a specific fear that the demon hungers for. One of these demons that is never short on potential victims is Hydrothala. This demon preys on those with a fear of water, and more often than not, those with thalassophobia, a fear of open water. While it is a very aquatic appearing creature with fins, tentacles, and a head like a blended shark and squid, the demon is well able to travel over land to seek out inland prey who stay well away from its ocean home. It can create an orb of water around itself, either by controlling the waters of the ocean or by expelling plumes of water from holes on its head and from beneath its tentacles. It can then hover that orb into the air, above the clouds even, to soar towards whatever target its fear sense leads it unto. When its prey is found, the demon will excrete more water to create another orb around the victim, making their head dip in and out of the water to keep them alive, but also give them the fear that they could drown at any moment. It will lift them into the air and fly them back to the ocean, where its torment will commence. If the victim does have the fear of open water, it will simply leave them and swim away, leaving the victim lost in the vast sea with nowhere to go for hours on end. The demon will loom in the depths, feeling the pulses of terror emanating from the prey before it swims back up to them and intermittently will wrap them in its tentacles, pull them under, and when they're on the brink of drowning, release them and allow them to swim back to the surface, but only long enough to take a short, breath before being pulled back down again and again and again. As is often the case, once the demon senses a sufficient level of terror in its victims, it will devour them with its dagger teeth, then slumber till its hunger awakens it again. Now I think this thing has one of the coolest creature heads I've ever drawn. It like I was I was going for a mix of a shark, a bit of an anglerfish and a squid, and I guess there might be a bit more anglerfish in there from the teeth than shark, but even more so than all that, it kind of looks like a xenomorph, like it really has the alien sort of head shape. That wasn't an intention I was going for, but you know, I'm cool with that. I really like the xenomorph design and I think this turned out really cool too. I like the rest of the body as well, it's just the head is the part where I was like, ooh, this turned out really, really cool. Also, this one was originally supposed to be more hydrophobia, the fear of water, but really from writing that lore, I guess it ended up leaning more thalassophobia. Although I, you know, wrote it into the lore that it's a demon that can feed off people with both fear of water and fear of open water. Really happy with this design. I feel like I can really cut loose with these demon designs and just put in whatever weird elements I think look cool. I mean, I guess I can always kind of do that, but I don't know. I feel like I have more freedom with these creatures than I do with some other ones I design. Anyway, hope you all like the result. Let's take a look at the finished version. There is one demon that above most others is able to imbue fear and nausea in its victims without having to do much more than stand in their line of sight. It is a beast called Triparog, and it hunts down those with a strong aversion to the sight of irregular patterns of repeating holes, also referred to as tripophobia. Even something as simple as a honeycomb can be deeply unpleasant to look at for someone with this phobia, so the sight of Triparog is nearly unbearable to them. When this demon senses someone's fear ignited, it will hunt them down and reveal itself when they're alone. 
To initiate further terror in them, the demon will lash out its whole speckled tongue and lick the victim's face, not only forcing them to feel the bumps of holes against their skin, but also poisoning them with its toxic lick that leaves them unable to close their eyes and nearly immobilized. Their muscles become so tight that they can barely walk, making it easy for the demon to circle around them and stay within their vision. As their victim quakes and has repeating panic attacks, putting them on the verge of heart failure, the demon will revel in how its appearance strikes terror into this poor being. If their fear takes even the slightest dip, the demon will then run its tongue along them again, slowly, over and over again. It will make the eyes hiding beneath its holes dart in every direction at random intervals, then all stare at the victim at once, before repeating the pattern. Finally, when its lust for fear is sated, it will wrap them up in its tongue and pull the victim's top half into its mouth. It won't devour them yet, however. It will simply roll them around in its mouth, further rubbing against the holes all over its gums to give them one last horrific jolt. Only then will it slurp the rest of them down, devouring them whole. Now doing this one was gross. It was gross looking at the reference images, it was gross drawing it, it's gross looking at it now, it was gross doing the writing for it, but it was by far the most requested one, so I definitely knew I had to do a trypophobia demon. And I was kind of excited to do it, and even though it was, you know, the whole process was a bit gross, it was still f like a fun kind of gross, you know, where I'm like, ugh, this is ugh, gross, and still drawing it. I don't know if that really makes sense. I do really like how this one turned out. It was easy to detail it because obviously I was putting holes everywhere. I mean, not everywhere. I tried to space them out a little bit. So there was some contrast of areas with holes, some areas without holes. And the overall drawing, I think actually looked kind of creepier and grosser when it was in the inking stage. The colors kind of smooth everything out a little bit, whereas it's obviously very high contrast having the holes with very dark spots when it's just in black and white. I don't have trypophobia specifically, but looking at some of the reference images on Google Images, there was some really nasty looking stuff that I did not want to look at for long when I was starting to draw this guy. Looked up some pictures, then was like, okay, I get the idea, put them away, and then got to drawing. One thing I will say for this guy though, which I mentioned how I thought the arachnophobia demon in the last episode was kind of cute looking, and a lot of people did not agree at all. This one, I think if you smoothed out all the holes, like just got rid of the holes on this one, then it would be cute looking. It would just be like a fun looking frog beast kind of thing. But with all the holes, definitely not cute. Anyway, hope you all like it or are grossed out by it or whatever you were hoping to get out of this drawing. Let's take a look. Now, as said previously, many demons have a myriad of potential victims to pull from. Demons such as Ophidamon or Hydrothala could sate themselves on those with their fear cravings from even a small town for quite some time. Archibatrops doesn't have that same privilege. This demon has a very specific fear hunger. He craves to devour those with the fear of getting peanut butter stuck to the roof of your mouth. It's a very specific phobia, but a real one to be sure. Archibatrops manages to find a victim every seven months or so, and will torment them by trapping them in a room and excreting peanut butter all over the walls and floor, from both its mouths, its hands, and the plumes of peanut butter on its back and legs. It will let the victims stew in their fear, surrounded by peanut butter, staring at them, unmoving, while it drips the spread from every orifice. Then, eventually, it will walk towards them slowly and force its hands into their mouths, leaving clumps of peanut butter so large that they can barely breathe and will inevitably get it stuck to the roof of their mouth. It's not the most dangerous demon around, and there have been a few to survive its attacks. And, in fact, one young man even managed to, well, do more than survive. Chris Peterson had a strong fear of peanut butter since he was a child, and never went near the stuff, didn't even want to be in the room with someone when they were eating it. He could barely even remember where it started, simply that he'd gotten it stuck to his mouth as a toddler and cried for hours over it. When Archibatrops sought him out, Peterson was initially horrified, but when he got to the point of the demon thrusting peanut butter into his mouth, he suddenly realized that he absolutely loved the taste of peanut butter. The demon tried to reignite his fear, but nothing happened. 
Archibatrops soon began to leave, but Peterson started following the demon, taking bites out of its hands to get more of the delicious crunchy spread. Soon the demon was feeling the very fear it had meant to imbue the boy with. It tried to run on its tiny legs, but couldn't move fast while the boy kept catching up and leaping on him to take more bites. Eventually it got away by shooting a massive glob of peanut butter at Peterson to stick him to a tree so it could escape. But to this day, Peterson not only loves peanut butter and eats it every day for breakfast, and often for dessert mixed with chocolate chips, but he has dedicated his life to learning about demons and finding out how to hunt down Archibatrops so he can trap it and forever have an endless supply of his new favorite breakfast spread. Now the drawing I was originally going to do next for this episode was Fear of Blood, and if I do a third episode in this series, I'm definitely going to do that because I've got some cool ideas for it. But when I posted the first teaser for this episode and saw this suggestion from Wahid Abdullah, and maybe a few other people have suggested this as well, this was just the first one that I noticed, I was just like, I've never heard of this fear, but that's too perfect and I have to work it into this episode. Anyone who's new to the channel, I've a bunch of times just eaten spoonfuls of peanut butter and chocolate chips. It's a recurring reference. If you go back to old episodes, you'll find it somewhere. But yeah, I thought it was too perfect and I thought it would be really funny. And like in the last episode where I worked in one story of someone overcoming their fear and escaping the demon, I want to make sure in each of these demon episodes to have one fun, goofy, or uplifting sort of story, because as much as I really like doing these episodes, the lore for these episodes is a lot more dour and depressing than a lot of my other episodes. I like having some uplifting stuff in there, so I figured this one would make for a good funny story. Not to mention the fact that I got to write in a character that's basically just supposed to be me. But anyway, let's take a look at how this demon turned out. Now many would consider dogs to be one of the greatest, most loving and pleasant animals on the planet. I mean, obviously they're often referred to as man's best friend. But there are also many with the polar opposite feeling. Fear of dogs is one of the most common phobias there is, which means that Cinefet is never short on victims. This demon stands on its hind legs at 12 feet tall, but is also able to shrink to half its size to run on all fours, making it look more similar to a Doberman Pitbull blend. In this form, it will often travel in forests near small towns, and purposely run by hikers to see if a sufficient fear is mobilized in their minds. When a victim gives the reaction they lust for, they'll herd the person deeper into the woods by sprinting around them, still in their smaller form, to force the victim farther and farther from safety and any possible help. Once it's lured them deep enough, it will start to grow and shift. Its eyes will glow green and its bones and veins will become more pronounced as it lurches back on its hind legs to stand at its full height. It will then let out a deafening howl that lures all dogs within 10 miles to its location. They'll all arrive in a hypnotized state and encircle the victim. They'll consistently bark at the person viciously, then they'll take turns darting in and biting at the victim, tearing into their legs to ensure they can no longer run. It will then make the dogs cease their attack for short periods to strike more fear of the unknown into the victim before allowing the dogs to attack again. Eventually, it will stop the attacks and open a gap in the entrapment of dogs, giving the person a way out. If they can summon the courage, they'll limp off and usually get about 50 meters away before Cinefet howls and sends all the dogs charging after the prey. This time, when the person is caught, the dogs will devour them. Cinefet doesn't even need to feast on the flesh itself. The demon simply craves the fear, which nourishes it like sunlight would a rose. It will then turn back to its smaller form and charge off to another town to slumber before its next meal. Now with this demon, I really wanted to use green as the pop of color for it. I talked in the last episode about how with every demon I wanted to make them mostly grey and black with one specific pop of color that's thrown in to make them a little bit more interesting and let them all be a little bit different looking from each other, although I have repeated some colors a few times now. But with this one, I didn't really know why green was the color I wanted to go with. I just thought it was going to work really well. And then when I was halfway through the coloring stage, I realized, oh yeah, that's because this thing basically just looks like Ben Wolf from Ben 10. 
In fact, I was even going to give this thing a double hinged jaw, which would have made it look way more like Ben Wolf. So I'm glad I didn't add the jaw thing, and, I, you know, I, I don't think it looks too similar. There definitely are a lot of similarities, but I think this thing's unique enough on its own. Although maybe if I look at some images of Ben Wolf again, I'll probably think, oh yeah, no, actually they are really, really similar. But oh well, I'm still super happy with how this one turned out. I especially like how the mouth turned out, just the big grin that keeps going back and back and back. I've, I've done that on a few of these demons, and I think just the big creepy grin really adds to the demonic sort of look. When the demon looks happy, I think it's just that much creepier. Also, one thing that I really liked in this drawing is that I made it feel like it had a little bit of movement right near the beginning of the coloring stage by just adding the little swoop of blood near its mouth that makes it look like it's turning its head. Just adding that little touch gave the piece a bit of movement that wouldn't have been there if I hadn't put it in. Anyway, I think this is a good one to end the video on, so let's take a look at the finished result. Every time your hairs stand on end, every time your heart thumps faster at a bump in the night, every time your breathing shallows as you ready to run from a perceived threat, you give off a scent that is unimaginably alluring to a demon. They crave fear like your lungs crave oxygen, and like there are different flavors of food, there are many distinct flavors of fear, and different demons crave different tastes. Nyctos of the Shadows is possibly the most well-fed of demons, as the flavor it seeks can be found in some small way in near every being on the planet. For no matter how brave or courageous you are, we all feel slightly more vulnerable and threatened when our vision is warped and obscured by the dark. It's very easy for our minds to play tricks on us when our senses are failing, and Nyctos preys on those in this state with a malicious lust to torment and to feed. It is a demon made from slimy blackness. Its body can harden and liquefy in a blink, and it can quickly sink away into any shadow available. When its senses prey with a particularly strong fear of the dark, it'll find them and spend a few days hidden from sight, but making the lighting in their home flicker and die at random, stirring up the initial fear. Once Nyctos feels ready for its real game to begin, it'll awaken its prey in the night by emitting a hissing sound long enough to wake them and force them to look around for the cause. It'll then slowly emerge its bubbly, slimy body from the densest shadow in the room and slowly come into full sight. Soon after, it'll hurl a piece of its own flesh at the person's eyes. It temporarily blinds them as Nikto spreads its mass all around the room to make it almost pitch black. Almost being the key word. See, there is a slight sense of calm to be had in complete blackness but it's the slightest flecks of light that seep through the dark to reveal shifting, moving, unusual shapes that causes true terror. So, when its victim has cleared their vision, Nyctos will allow fleeting spurts of purple light to reveal where it is as its mask-like face appears rapidly in different areas of the room. Bubbling and hissing sounds will emit all around the person as Nyctos torments them for hours, before sinking away into a shadow and vanishing. The terror will stew in its victim as they try to convince others the next day of what has happened to them to little effect. Maybe they'll move or sleep at a friend's home the next night, but wherever they go, Nyctos will find them again and once more enact its torture. Night after night it'll return, sometimes skipping an eve, to give them a false sense of hope that it's gone. But inevitably, Nyctos will return, and once it's had its fun, it will finally feast on the poor, fear-drenched meal. Now this one I was really excited to do because I had to be a little bit more conceptual with it, because in previous episodes with fear of dogs or fear of snakes, I'd do a scary looking dog, I'd do a scary looking snake, but with dark, there's not as much to go off of. So the idea that I went with was a demon that had a really amorphous body that could ooze out of shadows. And I think that was a really cool angle for this one because first of all it meant I could go wild with the proportions, which is one of the things I've been doing a lot in this series, but you know, I could push it even more with this demon. And it meant I was introducing a new kind of texture. All of the demons so far have had very 
rocky, grainy kind of skin. And I like the consistency of that, so they all look like they exist in the same world and are the same kinds of creatures despite being shape-wise very different. But I also really like this idea of introducing a new sort of texture, and I play with it a lot more in some of the other demons later on in this episode. Really happy with how this one turned out, hope you all like it as well. Here's our Nyctophobia demon. For many, clowns are merely a childlike form of entertainment. For some, the word itself is simply a term used as a throwaway insult for, say, a boss or higher-up one dislikes. But to some, even hearing reference to a clown can spark waves of terror. Something about a being disguised by both makeup and a comically fake smile understandably spurs inherent distrust and fear in these people. Unfortunately, that makes them the perfect targets for Kolroha. It's still unclear which came first, this demon or the colorful clad entertainers it resembles, but either way, it's not hard to see how this demon could have struck fear into many, even prior to a fear of clowns becoming common. This ghoulish being is close to human in stature, but it's also off in many unnerving ways. Its head, hands, and feet are all far too large for its body, and it has an impossibly large grin that can jut with dagger-like fangs. Its limbs are also rubbery and bend in unnatural ways, as though it has no bones. Kolroha can shift its body to temporarily appear like a regular human clown, and it will often walk down busy city streets this way to feel for the reaction it seeks. Many will give it strange looks and be on their way, but it often won't be long before it picks up the scent of a person who's just been struck with fear at the sight of Kolroha. It will then track that person to wherever it is they live and wait until the night. Once they're asleep, the demon will transport them to its lair, a run-down old funhouse with rotting wood and cracked mirrors. The victim will awaken to the sound of heinous chuckling before Kolroha will begin its games. None so far have lived to tell the tale of what goes on in that not-so-fun funhouse, but it's easy to imagine that for one with an intense fear of clowns, the torment is unbearable. Now for Fear of Clowns, I was a little bit hesitant to do this one because it's just been done so many times. Like, you know, immediately I thought of Pennywise or any other freaky monster clown, and I just thought, is there anything really original that I'm going to be able to bring to this? But once I sat with it for a few minutes, I was like, you know what? It might not be my most original drawing, but I do have some good ideas for how this could go. So one of the things I started in with was when I was doing the very initial rough drawing, I drew it as though I was doing a really goofy cartoon, like more rubbery kinds of limbs as I said in the lore, really pushing the proportions, gigantic feet, huge grin, and then with those really cartoony goofy proportions, then I start working in the monstrous textures and the creepy elements and dripping blood and fangs, and that combination of the cartoony body with the creepy textures I think just works so well. I've been trying to make a lot of my poses feel like they flow a little bit better in all of my episodes in the last little while, and I think doing something that was intended to start off a little bit more cartoony actually kind of helped me see that I can push that more in my other drawings. This drawing, it just feels like it has a really nice flow to it. I, everything about this one, I love how it ends up turning out, and I do add a little bit of the goopy sort of texture for its arms and legs, and just below its feet. I don't really know what inspired that for this character specifically, I just wanted to play with that a little bit more, and I think it is a nice element. Super happy with this one, and I hope you all are as well. Hope you're not afraid of clowns, because let's take a look at Kolroha. Having a fear of birds, also known as ornithophobia, is a somewhat common problem, and as expected there is a demon I've yet to discuss that aligns with that fear, but this next entity targets those with a much more specific bird-based fear. There are those rare few out there who have anatidaphobia, the fear that somehow, somewhere, a duck is watching them, and anatidamus is constantly on the lookout for these unfortunate few. 
This demon appears as a stony-skinned, horse-sized duck. And believe me, anyone should prefer the idea of fighting a hundred duck-sized horses to facing off with this beast. It has leering bug eyes that bore right into your soul, and it is invisible to any who do not have the fear it seeks. So to torment its victims, when it has located one, the demon will follow them from a distance and stand at afar, leering at them. Slowly, over the course of days or even weeks, they'll notice it more and more and their fear will grow and grow as the demon gets bolder with its distance, until it is eventually willing to stare them down from only a few yards away. They'll try anything to escape, running, leaving the country, even just looking away, but once the demon has targeted them, it is as though the poor soul can physically feel the eyes glaring into them. There has been one person to escape the demon's leer, a man named Gareth Larson, who'd long had the fear Anatodamus sought the scent of. A week into being stalked by the demon, he had an idea. Seeing the demon getting closer and closer each day, he realized he had to try something. So the next time he caught the eyes of the demon duck as it leered across a park at him one night, he simply leered back. He stared right into its menacing eyes and marched straight towards it. The duck moved towards him too, likely hoping to call his bluff, but this resulted in the two simply stomping right up to each other and having a stare-off in the middle of an open field. After minutes of this, Gareth's eyes grew red and bloodshot, but he refused to give up. Eventually, he started to notice that his foe was slowly shrinking. Anatodamus was getting smaller and smaller, weakened by the diminishing fear in its victim. Eventually, it got down to the size of a regular duck, and finally, unable to maintain its stare, the demon blinked. Gareth yelled, HA! at the demon and gave it a swift kick across the field. The demon waddled off and never bothered Gareth again, but it is still out there, seeking other victims, lurking, waiting, and of course, watching. That lore was a tough one to keep a straight face through, but like I've said in the last couple episodes, I like having one in here that's either funny or uplifting or something like that to kind of balance out these pretty unpleasant story-focused episodes. And surprisingly, this was the most requested phobia that I saw, which is funny because it's not actually a real phobia. I forgot what the origin of this was, and when I went looking into it, it turns out it was made in Farside Comics by Gary Larson, which I should have remembered because the second I saw the comic, I was like, Oh yeah, of course, I remember this. I used to read Farside comics all the time. My grandpa always had tons of them up at the cottage, and I read them almost every time I was up there. I thought they were great. Because this was kind of the joke one of the episode, I put a little bit less thought into it. I still think it turned out really well, but I kind of wish I'd pushed the proportions of the eyes a lot more. After doing the clown one, I look at this and I kind of go, oh, I really could have played with the proportions more. But that really is just a side note, because overall I do really like how this one turned out, and writing the lore for it was pretty fun. I hope you all enjoy our demon duck thing. Let's take a look at it. In a way, all fears come from within ourselves, as it's our mind's perception of external events and beings that brings us terror. But for some, the source of their fear physically exists within their own bodies, and within the bodies of all humanity. Some people are deathly afraid of blood. Even seeing a small trickle from a paper cut can cause massive anxiety, nausea, and even fainting. Seeing a large wound on themselves or others can be a traumatic event, so someone with this fear, seeing Haemophilus, is beyond a waking nightmare. This demon is a humanoid with perpetually gushing wounds all over its body. While demons don't technically bleed, the liquid that spills from this one is actually that of its past victims, and it keeps it circulating through its own body for use as a weapon. When a targeted victim is alone at night, Haemophilus will stumble towards them, appearing as a horrifically injured human. As it feels the anxiety spiraling in its prey, it will speed up, and the blood from its body will form together into a tendril or a tail that it will use to grab its victim. If they try to scream, it will spill blood into their mouth to quiet them, as it carries them off to a more isolated area. Once alone, Haemophilus will force the person to watch as more and more wounds open across its body and spill out the crimson liquid. 
Eventually, with its gravelly skin, it will then start to cut small wounds on the victim, forcing them to see their own blood spilled and merging with the blood of the demon. There is one proven way to beat Haemophilus, but it's something few of its victims have had the stomach to try long enough to succeed. The prey simply has to fight him, but every punch, kick, stab, or strike opens more and more wounds on the demon which will drip more and more blood. So the potential victim has to hold strong their constitution and keep hitting the demon until they've shown that they won't back down. Once the demon is pummeled and truly wounded and needing to retreat, then they may be safe. It's not a task that's easy for someone with a fear of blood, but if they want to survive to see the sunrise, they'll have to keep fighting their inner and outer demon. Now this was a demon I'd considered doing for all three of the episodes so far, and I even almost didn't do it for this episode. I actually started by doing a cryophobia demon because I thought it would be really cool to have like an icy polar bear that, uh, sorry, that's the fear of cold. And I do like the idea of doing that one too, but partway through that drawing I was just like, I don't know, I really want to do the blood demon. And I was also a little bit concerned to do this one in the same episode as the clown demon because I knew I wanted this one to also be very human in shape. And I wasn't sure if there would be enough variety doing this and the clown in the same episode, but I think they definitely ended up looking very distinct from each other. The concept I knew I wanted to do was a very human sort of demon with just lots of wounds cut open in it. The blood tail was kind of a last minute thing that I just thought would be cool from a design perspective and I knew I could work it into the lore in a fun way. Having its guts spilling out I thought would be pretty cool looking and kind of gross looking. And then one of the weirder parts of this one I guess is I made its legs almost look like they belong on a chubby person and its upper body and arms look like a really skinny person. Honestly I have no idea why I ended up doing that. I kind of just wanted to play around with the proportions. There's not really a reason in the lore for it to be that way. All the same, I'm super happy with how this one turned out. Hope you all like it as well. Let's take a look at the Hemophobia Demon. When fear takes hold of us, it can often expand and multiply in its dominance over our better judgment leaving us a panicking, hyperventilating mess of irrational reaction instead of intelligent response. This state of exaggerated alarm and terror is the deepest craving and hunger of the soulless, ravenous entities that we call demons. While all demons have different skill sets when it comes to their ability to terrify, with some only able to scare certain people, Others are so horrifically malicious that they could drench in fear near any they came across. One of these such beings is the demon known as Claustraniac. This monster has a humanoid head and arms atop a rotund body that opens into a gaping slimy maw. From its back spawn three worm-like tentacles that can expand to swallow people whole. Those that this demon seeks out most are beings with a fear of tight spaces, and its physiology is such that it can draw that fear to the front of their mind within seconds of encountering these poor souls. When their prey is found, alone, often in the night, this demon will latch onto their feet with one of its tentacles and slowly slurp them inside, reveling in their victim's struggle as their whole body is slowly devoured more and more into the constricting tendril. The initial feasting will often last 10 minutes, but once they're inside, the torment does not end with them suffocating. Against all logic, the victim is able to breathe inside the tentacle, and so they remain alive, squeezed so tightly they can barely move as they slowly slide along for hours until they're finally dropped into the beast's stomach. While the demon doesn't need to breathe, its body pulses as if it is breathing, so that the dark space around the victim expands, giving them the slightest room to move, then retracts, squeezing them tightly once again. It will vary the speed and depth of the squeeze to stay unpredictable and keep the person's fear growing and growing, unsure how long the beast will keep them alive inside this cruelly tight space. In some cases, it will allow its stomach to open slightly so the victim can see light pouring in and give them hope of escape. 
In even crueler cases, it will let the person push free and run just so it can chase them down again and once more gulp them slowly through its tentacle and start the process all over again. Only after a sufficient degree of terror has bathed their prey will Claustraniac commence digesting the poor soul inside them. Now going into this design felt very similar to going into the Nyctophobia demon design, Nyctos of the Shadows from the last episode, where there wasn't as obvious an idea going into it as with some of the other demon designs. And the first thing that came to my mind when I thought of claustrophobia was when I saw King Kong, the 2005 Peter Jackson one. There's a scene where a bunch of the characters in the movie are in this bug pit with these giant bug creatures, and I think it's Andy Serkis's character gets attacked by something that looks like the tentacles on this guy, that they start, like, slowly eating over his arms and then his head, and he's still kind of thrashing around as they're just slowly engulfing his whole body, and ugh, it just creeped me out so much. But I felt like it was such a good idea to use for this guy, then having that only be one part of the tormenting process for this demon, having them in the stomach as it's kind of breathing and giving them more space and less space, all that just felt like it was going to work really well for the concept, and I feel like design-wise it all came together super nicely. Really love this one, I think it's one of the best demons I've done in the series so far, and I hope you all like our claustrophobia demon. Insects are not a kind of creature that many people would claim to love. Ask the average person their thoughts on these multi-legged critters that crawl around underfoot and buzz by overhead, and the general response would likely range from dislike to disdain. But some people feel much more strongly even still. Some people have a severe fear of insects, and these are the people that Entomantis commonly seeks out. This demon is a 12-foot tall hornet beast whose buzzing wings can be heard from a mile away, but only by those who it's chosen to prey upon. You see, it can shrink down to the size of a common hornet, and will do so to remain inconspicuous as it locates its victim. Once it's sought someone out, it will spend a day buzzing around them intermittently, stirring up the initial ripples of fear. Once the swell has begun, it will land on them, sting them, then fly away. As the venom sinks into their blood, the sounds of insects will be amplified all around them, crawling and skittering, clicking their mandibles and buzzing their wings. Soon after, the feeling of bugs crawling along their skin will become a constant sensation that they can't escape from, slowly driving them mad. Soon after, the creature will hunt them down in its full size, grab them out of their daily life, and whisk them off to a forest or cave. There, Entomantis will bite their prey, releasing a new toxin into their blood, which quickly makes them irresistible to all insects around. All kinds of bugs will swarm towards the victim, crawling into their hair and under their clothes, even into their ears and nose. Sometimes Entomantis will even leave them like this for days, allowing them to run through the wilds trying to escape the insects, but only drawing more and more to them as they flee. Some have managed to escape the swarms by getting to water and staying submerged for as long as they can, only briefly popping up for air when they have to, until the venom wears off. But even then they have to discover another way to escape, before Antomantis finds them, bites them again, and draws the swarms to them once more. Now this wasn't one that was difficult to come up with a concept for right off the bat. It was like the snake demon or the dog demon, it's just, you know, I was gonna pull a whole bunch of different freaky bug elements and make as monstrous looking of a bug as I could. I focused most of my attention on its head, I knew I wanted to give it two sets of eyes and, and like try out a bunch of different mandibles and just lots of different elements. I was looking at a lot of close-ups of bugs' heads to get ideas, and there was so much cool stuff to pull from. I wasn't sure if I was gonna be creeped out looking at close-ups of bugs, but they didn't really freak me out that much. I mean, I think looking at a close-up of a bug to me is less creepy than seeing one out of the corner of your eye skitter towards you or something like that. I don't love bugs, I don't strongly dislike bugs. Personally though, I will 
jump a lot if something buzzes past my ear but to be fair that's partially because in my life i've twice been attacked by full hives of wasps and hornets and beyond that i've been stung another like eight to ten times for some reason wasps and hornets and bees they all just really like stinging me though it has been a while so i don't want to jinx it gonna knock on wood but anyway there's not really a ton to describe for this one i really just did go all out with different freaky bug elements i think it turned out really cool maybe not quite one of the creepier ones but if you're afraid of insects then maybe it will be to you let's take a look at the finished result there are many kinds of social phobias they range from the fear of eating around others to the fear of public speaking, but some dig to a deeper, more specific depth in certain people. Public speaking can be intimidating to many, but in the context of that very act, some gain genuine terror from speaking to a mass of people and coming across a long word. It's essentially a fear of mispronouncing or misspeaking and being mocked by peers as a result. This fear is called Hippopotamonstrosis quipedeliophobia, and while it is more rare than many other fears, it too has a demon who seeks those who have it. Hippocopus alicomonstrumus is a three-eyed humanoid demon with a decaying dictionary for a head. Constantly swirling around it are rings, on which are written some of the longest words in multiple languages, changing to suit that spoken by the victim it seeks. This demon doesn't eat as frequently as many others, but when it finds its prey, it will torment them slowly, drinking in their fear from afar for months before finishing them off. It hunts down those with fear of social situations who have just moved to a new town or school. While they sleep, it will send its rings into their room to swirl around them, haunting their minds with thoughts of massively long words and nightmares about misspeaking and stuttering before new people they wish to make a good impression on. With their mind cursed each night, during the day, any time they get in front of a group of even just five people to speak, their thoughts will be flooded with long words that they can't possibly hope to pronounce on the first try. Any book they open will appear to be made up of words with a minimum of seven syllables each. They'll grow more and more terrified about the idea of even talking to others. They'll keep away from any people, fearing slipping up in their speech and embarrassing themselves. The more they pull away from interactions with others, the more fear is able to stew in their mind and marinate them for Hippocopus's feasting. There is one proven way to defeat this demon and to ward it off from you if it has set its sights on devouring you. The day it's decided to come for you and finish you off will always be one in which you find yourself in front of a large group of people. The demon's name will flash briefly in your mind and you must say it out loud to all the people around. They'll have no idea what you're talking about. It will likely be embarrassing, but it's even alright to stumble through the name. The point is to say it with as much confidence as possible, and show the demon that your fear is conquerable and not worth losing your life over. When you say Hippocopus Alico Monstrumus's name aloud, you're essentially saying, you can't have me, demon. Now this was actually supposed to be the goofy one of the episode. I put out a poll asking people what they wanted the goofy demon to be for this episode, either Turophobia, the fear of cheese, or this. And I didn't really know much about this one, I'd just seen a lot of people recommend it as the fear of long words, and, you know, it obviously being funny that Hippopotamonstrosis quipedeliophobia is a super long word. But then, obviously, you heard from that lore. When I looked into it, I kind of get that social phobia a little bit. Like, I wouldn't say I have it, but that's definitely, if you have a fear of public speaking, coming across a massive word would obviously make it a lot worse. So the lore for this one didn't really end up being as funny as, say, you know, the peanut butter stuck to the roof of your mouth demon or something like that, but it was still a fun one to work with. I had the idea right away to have some big words kind of swirling around the character, and then I also really liked the idea of making its face slash mouth a big sort of grinning book, and then the decaying element was a fun part to make it a little bit more demonic. Don't know where the idea for the three eyes came from, just kind of came to me in the moment and I went with it, along with a lot of the other stuff in this design. But I like it, hope you all do too, here's our Hippopotamonstrosis Quipedeliophobia demon.
Cleanliness is something that many take pride in. It's always good to be conscious of your hygiene, but some become overly obsessive about staying perfectly clean. Some are so afraid of dirt and germs that they'll do anything and everything to avoid coming in contact with any surface on which may lie bacteria. An old friend of mine used to have this very fear. He wouldn't even set foot in a park, terrified of getting his shoes muddy and then having to clean them off. And because Clayton was so terrified of germs, he drew the attention of the demon Misomucus. Misomucus is an oozing, demonic orb that resembles a large germ. It stands at 7 feet tall and walks on its hands, which, as a result, are constantly covered in dirt and mud. It shoots foul-smelling clouds of spores that activate allergies in any who inhale it, but much more severely in those who are in a state of fear. Now, when the demon came for Clayton in his first year of high school, it was not only coming for him. You see, his fear was transgenerational. He'd gotten it from his father, who obsessively cleaned every surface in their house constantly and rarely left home to avoid interactions with germs. So the day the demon came to their home, when Clayton's mother was out of town, Misomucus was set for the feast of its life. It surrounded Clayton's home in a swirling cloud of spores, then crashed its way through their wall. It scurried around their home, stamping its muddy hands on every surface, but especially on those near an exit. Clayton and his father were both too terrified to step out into the cloud of swirling spores and germs outside, and eventually huddled together in a corner as the demon briefly left, then stomped back into the house with an extra thick layer of mud on its hands, leaving a trail as it stomped towards the two cowering beings in the corner. The demon scooped into its hand a glob of the mucus constantly drooling from its orifices, mixing it in with the mud, then spreading it across both Clayton and his father. Clayton's father was quaking and sweating profusely. Clayton too was terrified, but something clicked in his mind as he sat there before a demon covered in dirt and grime and filth. He felt disgusting, but it wasn't killing him. If he was already covered in germs, then it couldn't be any worse if he escaped by running out into the smog outside. He tried everything to pick his dad up and tell him to run, but the man couldn't move. He was paralyzed in terror. The demon scooped up more of its mucus, slowly raising it towards them, but Clayton closed his eyes and tackled into the demon, pushing it back. Sensing his fear diminishing, it grabbed him and hurled him out a window into the spores outside. Clayton instantly started to sneeze and his eyes swelled and itched. His head throbbed as he limped his way back into the house, trying to find his father. But soon, the spores overtook him and he fainted. When he came to, his house was clean. The walls were undamaged and the spores outside were gone. But so too was Clayton's father. He never saw his dad again and has a pretty fair estimate of what happened to him. Clayton thereafter completely conquered his fear of germs. He read up on the human immune system to increase his confidence in his body's ability to protect him from germs, and would actively seek out situations in which he'd have to get dirty, even partaking in mud runs for a heavy dose of exposure therapy. Soon after, he turned his attention towards demons, learning all he needed to know about them to start hunting them down and making sure no others fell at the hands of these monsters as his father had. Unfortunately for him, his dad wouldn't be the last person he'd lose to a demon. Now that lore was a little bit longer than some of the other ones, so I don't really have time for many design notes, but for anyone who watched Benny Sharp Saves Christmas from Lots and Lots of Demons, now you have a better idea of some of Clayton's background. And for people who haven't watched it, he was a character introduced in that original story episode. Anyway, let's take a look at the finished result. Throughout human history, many have lost their lives to the elements. Fire, cold, storms, rock slides, these all still take lives to this day, though as humanity has advanced, we've developed more and more ways to protect ourselves from such things. Even still, there are many who have overwhelming fears of the various elements, and little do most know that those very fears may be drawing unto them a demon. 
Fear of the wind is a rare occurrence, but does indeed happen, and while there are many demons that would be well fit to terrorize those with such a fear, one specifically seeks these people out. Onamind. This demon is a four-winged beast that can spit violent winds and even small tornadoes from the holes in its stomach. It bears a human head with an extra eye and constantly totes a wide, eerie grin. This creature rests in massive storm clouds, floating dormant, until the winds take it close enough to someone with the fear it seeks. When the scent is caught, it descends for its feast. For days prior to its full introduction to its victim, Onamind will batter their home with strong winds, rattling their doors and windows through the night as they lose more and more sleep, becoming ever more susceptible to strong bouts of terror. They'll likely start to suspect something strange is happening as they speak to others in their community and hear that no one else is experiencing such winds in their area. As growing confusion accompanies fear, Onamind will eventually reveal itself to its prey. It will send a small twister to their home, just as they're stepping outside, and this guided wind will scoop up the terrified soul off the ground and carry them up and up into the air, till they're left being whipped around in a dark cloud, being pelted by rain, their ears being rocked with the thunderous winds swirling all around them. Onamind will circle them, at first staying far enough away to not be fully seen through the haze, but drawing ever nearer each minute. All the while, its face will be directed towards them, bending and contorting in every which way, ecstatic from the horrified scent its prey is giving off. It will control the winds around them to batter its prey, sending them hurling and spiraling through the air, falling from the sky only to be scooped up again. After however many hours of this, the victim will likely eventually pass out, but their horror won't end there. Onamind will have its wind place them down in a vast open field, and when they awaken, will begin with only a light breeze around them. As they try to run and find their way to any kind of help, the cruel beast will soon have its strong winds kick up again, and soon, once more, the terrified prey will be up in the clouds, being rocked by ever more of the winds they so fear. It's kind of funny, it's actually super windy outside at the time I'm recording this, so I'm hoping that sound isn't really coming through. But anyway, for this design, I actually thought initially when I first finished this piece that it was the worst one from the episode, but the next day, in fact this morning, I ended up going back to it and adding a bunch of details. I did record it, so you'll see it at the end. And I think the added bits of just texture and little like weird patterns I put on it really helped flesh this one out and make it one of the best drawings of the episode. Though definitely not the best one, that's, that's the next one. I really love the next one. But anyway, for the design, I was actually taking inspiration from something a few people have suggested over the course of this series, that I take a look at depictions of biblically accurate angels. I didn't totally know what people meant when they were suggesting that, but I did finally look into it, and they're a little bit freaky looking. They got like tons of different wings and just eyes all over the place, and usually like a big eye and some weird rings floating around them. And I might use that if I do end up doing an angels kind of counterpart series to this series. But taking a bit of inspiration with the multiple wings for this demon, I feel like that really worked out. Hope you all like it, and let's take a look at the finished result. Many find the cold to be unpleasant. Depictions of comfortable people often show them under blankets with a hot drink or out on a sunny beach, either way somehow keeping their bodies warm. But well beyond a mild dislike of lower temperatures, there are some who have a relentless fear of the cold, and they are who the ice demon Cryoarot seeks for its meals. This fiend resembles a polar bear, though one with four glowing eyes, a long icy tail, and many parts of its body replaced with jutting ice. No matter how hot the temperature around it, this beast's frozen limbs will not melt in the slightest. This is an essential trait for the demon, as it often hunts prey in warm climates. Those who live in cold regions are less likely to fear the cold, as they've been around it all their lives, so Cryoarot will often do its hunting in some of the hottest places on Earth. 
When it sniffs out a victim, this creature will not hold back, taking an initially subtle approach as many other demons do. It will openly charge at its victim and snatch one of their limbs in its icy maw, then drag them off to an isolated location, sometimes a forest or plain or even a desert if one is nearby. As it drags them off, the unbreakable icicles making up its lower jaw will be seeping a frigid venom into the veins of its victim. This will make it impossible for the being's body to get warm, no matter how hot the air around them, but it will also keep them just warm enough to not die from the cold. After what could be an hour of being dragged off by this creature, it will toss them to the ground and run around them with its thundering icy feet in a wide ring, creating a frozen wall nearly 20 feet high. It will be a jagged structure with many jutting icicles sticking out. Then, the creature will leave. It will wait on the outside of this wall as its victim stews in terror and confusion at what is going on. Eventually, as they grow colder and colder, they'll realize that, even with a possibly mangled limb, they have to try and escape. As if that were a real possibility. They'll go to the icy wall and realize climbing out is possible, but to do so, they of course will have to grip onto the jagged icy structure with all their might. Some will simply give up there and then, but the prey Cryoarot yearns for most are the ones who try for the climb. Some will build slight stores of hope that as they pull their way up the wall higher and higher they may escape, but it is unimaginably sweet for this demon to stomp that hope back into terror as their prey reaches the top of the wall and it lashes its frigid tail at them from the other side, knocking them back down to the ground in the icy prison. Some may try again, but many will not. Regardless, they'll spend upwards of a week growing hungrier and more tired, and more importantly growing colder and colder and more terrified, until finally the demon breaks through its own walls and begins its feast. This is one of my favorite things I've drawn in a while. I really like how this one turned out. I've had the idea for this demon for ages. I think I might have even mentioned a cryophobia demon in one of the earlier episodes. Also, by the way, the reason I'm not doing water here, which, you know, for an Elements episode, water is kind of more fitting, but I've already done a Fear of Water in the second Phobias as Demons episode. So I was like, ah, let's go with ice. And the main inspiration I was taking for this is from a frost demon that was drawn by Trent Kenayuga, who has a YouTube channel and actually drew the design that I was referencing on his YouTube channel. And this, anytime I've drawn an ice creature, basically, I've been referencing this drawing by him. I just think it's one of the coolest creature designs I've ever seen. I'll link the video where he drew it in the cards in the description. And I really wanted to try to design an icy creature that I personally like as much as I like that drawing of his. And I... I think I might have gotten there with this one. I really like how this guy turned out. And of course, I hope you all like it as well. Let's take a look. While demons are ruthless and horrific hunters, it is not impossible to escape them. In fact, the main tactic to do so, at a mention, sounds simple. You must overcome your fear of them. If you do this, they will lose interest and likely leave you be, but of course a solution being simple doesn't make it easy. Even still, I know of a tale in which someone who had a lifelong, unusual fear of rocks managed to overcome their fear even in the midst of an attack from the stone demon Petreomp. This demon appears as a set of massive boulders covered in moss and vines and glowing green eyes that, when closed with it staying completely still, makes it appear like a natural part of its terrain. It's a massive and menacing demon, but proven not inescapable. As a boy, Aaron had been relentlessly bullied, and for some time those who tormented him would pelt him with rocks every day on his way home from school. Even after his family moved and his external circumstances became better, his pain from this experience manifested itself into a fear of rocks that plagued him into his adult life. He tried to always stay in cities far from nature and away from anywhere he may come across many stones. But one day he was invited by co-workers to go out camping. 
He'd been hoping to become better friends with those he worked with, and after much research into the area they'd be going, he saw that it was a flat, very forested area, with no mountains nearby and likely no more rocks than the pebbles he'd see lining the sidewalk in the city. He agreed to go, and as he left the city, Petreomp caught his scent. A few days into the trip, everything was going well, though waves of anxiety had surged through Aaron at a few different points. One night, Aaron wandered away from his tent to go to the washroom, and while all the others were asleep, Petreomp saw its opportunity to strike. With astounding silence for a creature of its size, it marched its way between him and his campsite, sitting itself down like a barrier before he turned. When he finally did, he saw the stone structure and his heart started to pound. He hoped he was dreaming, and tried to avert his gaze and simply walk around it, but before he could, it opened one glowing eye. The light emanating from it drew Aaron's confused and horrified gaze, and terror swelled in him as more and more of the eyes peeled open. Then, he just ran, back into the woods, unsure of where he was going but simply wanting to be anywhere else. The creature stomped on after him, letting his terror grow until it deemed him ready for the next level of torment. It sped up and stomped a stone foot into his path, then blocked every direction he tried to move with its massive rocky limbs. It bumped and battered him with each of its stony legs, looming its body above him, revealing its underside to be a luminous green maw of jagged geodes. Eventually, it dropped its body down over him, so he was completely encased inside the creature, surrounded by spiky rocks. His breathing was fast and shallow and tears welled in his eyes as the spikes around him ever so slowly started growing in towards him. He looked all around himself and realized this horrifying and baffling situation was likely now inescapable. And somehow that gave him a sense of calm. He didn't want to die, but if it seemed so certain that he would, in the very least he wanted to enjoy his final moments. He looked all around him at the glowing rocks and took in that while they were clearly about to be his end, they were also beautiful. These forms, these rocks, were part of the element he'd spent so much of his life fearing and avoiding, and yet there was so much wonder he could now see in them. With the spikes still drawing nearer and nearer, his breathing slowed as he focused on the beauty of this final sight, which didn't end up being so final. With his heart rate slowed and a baffling switch in perspective, Aaron became an unsuitable meal. The fear Petreomp craved had nearly vanished, and soon, it simply lifted off him and wandered away. Of course, nobody in his life believed Aaron about what had happened, and he hadn't really expected them to. But he knew it had been real, and that if he could overcome his fear in a moment like that, he could do the same long term. He spent a year doing exposure therapy, keeping small collections of rocks and geodes in his home, trying to appreciate the beauty in them as he had on that night. Eventually, he became confident enough to go out on rock-laden hikes, and started doing this every weekend. He became more and more comfortable with the minerals that had once terrified him, and now, ten years later, he is one of the world's most accomplished rock climbers. When he tells the tale of what happened to him to initiate the eradication of his fear, he now claims that it was a vivid dream he'd had. But those of us who've worked for the Predator Coalition of Demon Hunters know that what actually occurred was a genuine, remarkable feat of bravery in the face of certain death. While previous fears may come across to some as silly, few would judge someone for being afraid of fire. It is the most blatantly destructive of the elements, and no more than a few licks of a flame against your skin could cause significant pain. Because of this, the demon Pyrelius has a much easier time finding its next victim than other demons discussed. Pyrelius' body is a shifting construct of molten rock, lava, and sputtering flames, it is one of the smallest demons, commonly appearing like a three-foot-tall imp. It can dampen its flames and harden the lava forms on it to easily hide inside the homes of its victims. 
There, it will start small flames around the house, starting with places where the flames could be easily explained as accidents. It will fray wires from lamps and ignite a carpet nearby, it will cast flames into an oven to torch food, or cause surges in stovetop burners. The creature can spend as much as a month slowly increasing the rate of its attacks, drinking in the ever-increasing terror of its fire-fearing victim. Some have gone so far as to move, or simply go stay with a friend, while they have someone look into what may be going wrong with their home but the creature will simply follow them to wherever they go next, possibly letting the attack stop for a few days to give them a false sense of hope, before igniting another flame. Eventually, it will make the attacks harder for the victim to explain away. It will torch their blinds or awaken them to a fire on the pillow next to them. It may even start a fire inside their refrigerator for an extra nudge of confusion. Once enough terror has bubbled within them, Pyrelius will begin its endgame. The demon will ignite all the outer walls of their home or residence. The victim may push through their fear enough to try dousing the flames with water, but fire started by Pyrelius will only go out when it so chooses. The flames will slowly creep inwards, burning through all the victim's belongings as it shrinks the area in which they can avoid being burned themselves. Near the end, the imp will simply be sitting on a piece of furniture nearby, staring in full view at the victim, drinking in the scent of smoke and terror until the flames finally reach and cook the demon's meal to its ideal temperature. Charred black. Now, I'm not sure why, but I knew that I wanted to do a kind of lean and small demon for this one. Maybe it's because I knew a bunch of the other demons in this would come across as being a bunch bigger, and for something to be scary, I don't think they really need to be big. I mean, I, if you think about the most terrifying comic book villain, it's probably the Joker. He's not really a big guy. For the design, I was actually kind of funny enough taking inspiration from the imps in Hell of a Boss, the main characters in Hell of a Boss, which I still have to do another Hell of a Boss episode at some time in the near future, but it's hard to follow the first one I did because Hell of a Boss Horror Story episode is one of my favorite episodes I've done on the channel. But anyway, so I was taking inspiration from those shaped kind of imps, and then also, you might be able to tell a bit from Ghost Rider, because I really like the flaming skull kind of look, but to make it not too much of a ripoff of him, I made the head not like a full humanoid kind of skull, made it a little bit more creature-like, and tried to make it so that the eyes were kind of made from flames and smoke. Overall, I think that ended up making this thing look really cool. I really like the proportions. Not my favorite drawing of the episode, but and actually, I think it actually has a bit of a Digimon kind of look. I don't know if there's a specific one I'm thinking of, but I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm just being weird, or let me know in the comments if you think this has a bit of a Digimon look to it. But anyway, I hope you all like it, and let's take a look at how it finished up. Well, if you watched all the way through to now, I'm assuming that you really enjoyed this episode, but regardless, thank you all the same for watching. And if you want another lengthy video with a similar tone, you might want to check out my Pokemon as SCPs compilation. But besides that, that's all for today, except of course for ending this video on some kind of positive or inspiring note, and I'm kind of amped up today, so I'm gonna go with a harder one than usual. If you are consciously listening to this and understanding what I'm saying, then that means you are part of the most adaptable, intelligent, and resilient species to ever walk this earth. Even if you somehow manage to be born the dumbest and weakest human being alive, that still makes you a human being with more potential than 99.9% .9 of life on this planet. So if you're not already, start acting like that's the case. Start learning the skills you want to have in this life and start going after the life that you want to live because you absolutely have the potential to get what you want out of life. I hope that's inspiring to someone out there. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I love you all, and I'll see you all in the next episode on Monday. Goodbye.